why this topic? I, uh, in my clinic, the Norwegian FA uh, Sports Medicine Clinic, which I <laughs> established together with a couple of others and the Norwegian Football Federation in, in 2010, uh, we have seen a lot of athletes, a lot of football ballers, but also other athletes. And I have had a specific interest into <coughs> groin injuries. Uh, and I know also from a lot of publication from this, uh, from this hospital that this is also a key area here. Um, before I continue, I needed to present this to you. I have no disclosures. And here are the learning uh, objectives. Classify uh, groin and hip injuries in youth athletes according to the DOA agreement. Outline the most common clinical findings in youth athletes with pubic apophysitis. Explain the key investigations clinicians should perform to establish the diagnosis to pubic apophysitis. And there are people in this room, Andreas, Sacco, and not the least Rod, being involved in research in this area, <laughs> in this clinic, and have published a lot of great papers. So, congratulations. Yeah, we have some footballers in Norway that are quite talented. Not only cross-country skiers. And Martin Oedego, he joined Real Madrid at the age of 16. He's now, he's born in December 1998. And when he joined uh, uh, Real Madrid, all the other clubs in the world wanted him. So he's not, he was not bought by the trainer or the manager. He was bought by the, the president of the club because he, he thought this is one of the greatest talent. We need to get him. And then he has slowly developed into become one of the best players in La Liga, playing for uh, Real Sociedad and also for the Norwegian national team. His uncle is the manual therapist for the national team, first team of Norway. And he has treated him for a long time because he has had several issues with his groins and hips. And I think that's the reason. The reason is that he has covered between 25 and 35 hours of football every week since he was five, six years old. We have a family of, of, of runners. There are seven kids, and three, are, three of them are running one of the, they are among the best runners in the world. And this is the youngest, Jakob Ingebrigtsen. He participated in the World Cup athletics in Doha two weeks, uh, two months ago. And he was very disappointed because he just received a fourth place in the 1500 and a fifth place in the 5K. Not bad for an 18-year-old uh, boy. He has also trained more than usual and more specific than other, uh, than other athletes at the same age. He started young as at the age of six, I think. But... Uh, to my knowledge, he hasn't had any issues with his, his groins. But a lot of athletes, track and field athletes, have problems with their groin. Let me first take a step back before I answer the question. What is groin pain? The terminology of sports-related groin pain has been inconclusive for a long time. I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these terms, but I guess not all of you can tell the difference. Define these diagnoses clinically. I can't. However, sports medicine science develops. In Doha, November 
2014, a consensus meeting took place. I know some of you already were here at that time and participated in that conference. 24 uh, growing experts from 14 countries were part of the consensus group. The aim was to agree on standard terminology and the definitions of growing pain in athletes. And the meeting resulted in a growing paper, which is highly cited. The what they created was a clinical system to, to divide into different <laughs> entities. And uh, three entities were, three uh, areas were clinical entities of growing pain. Hello, good morning, good to have you here. Second, hip related growing pain and other causes of growing pain. Let's take a closer look at the four, four defined clinical entities for groin pain. Adductor related groin pain shown in blue. Um, on the illustration to the right, a big muscle with a short tendon inserting to the pubic symphysis. Iliopsoas related groin pain shown in green with a proximal and distal part and including the iliacus muscle. Inguinal related groin pain shown in purple, localized in the conjoint tendon region, and pubic related groin pain shown in yellow, including the symphysis and the medial parts of the pubic bone. I'm sure you all are familiar to this picture. How big is the problem in, atle in at uh, athletic runners? There are, to be fair, few studies. And sprints, distance running, and jump events account for about 65% of all injuries. And there are mainly overused injuries to the lower extremity. Girls a little less than boys. How big is the problem in youth football? Pelvic and groin injuries account for around 5 to 21 percent. It increases with maturation. They are mostly adductor related in football, but often presents with multiple entities. And hip related groin pain is quite uncommon in youth footballers. And there is a gender difference, less groin injuries in females compared to males. What do uh, we know about each sport it has its very, what we do know is that every sport has its specific movements, patterns. So, so it's, we can't if you look at this picture of, of a female runner, hurdle runner, it's quite different to, to 400 hurdles. And here you see uh, the world champion this year in Doha, uh, Karsten Warholm. He won uh, the, a gold medal. He was gold medalist uh, in, in 400 hurdles. Uh, and he has, also, uh, he has won that title twice before. And yet another example from football players, <coughs> illustrated by two typical football actions and movements, such as heading duel to the left and a running duel with a subsequent sudden change in direction to the right during match play. Each sport has its specific sports <laughs> movements. It, this is why sporting, specific sporting drills are so crucial when preparing for competitions. You can imagine I love my country. It's nice in other places, but where you are born, and when you are used to pictures like this or nature like this, it's quite impressive. 
I just want to present to you the Norwegian experience because I have too little experience from Aspetar to tell what the Aspetar experience is, but Andrea, Sarko, and Rod and others can probably help uh, to establish the bigger picture. When we established the FA Sports Medical Center, uh, owned by the Norwegian Football Federation, that was back in 2009. This is an insurance-based medical center seeing athletes of all ages. <coughs> I see around 200 athletes yearly, or I saw around 200 athletes yearly with groin and hip uh, pain. Going back to this center, we, it's insurance-based and 24 federations in Norway are sending their patients to our, our clinic or to 400 clinics, sports physicians, and, and, uh, and um, sports physiotherapists shattered around Norway. So up at least 800,000 athletes <coughs> are included in this system. In our center, when we, we look at the, the groin problems, the age group is mainly between 12 and 45 years of age. Uh, mainly football players, but we also see ice hockey players and track and field athletes. Adductor related problems are most common. And in the young athletes, we see a lot of apophysitis. At least we think we do. But we also see some iliopsoas related and pubic related uh, uh, problems in young uh, runners. Let's look at a couple of examples. First, an example of iliopsoas related groin pain. Can you read this? Yeah. This is a 19-year-old girl, track and field sprinter, tra about seven training sessions a week, about 20 competitions a year. She had gradual onset of pain, frontal left hip, and lower abdomen. Pain worsened by, during activity, but also after the training sessions. At, in particular, after sprinting activities. Pain on palpation of the iliopsoas muscle and around the pubic apophysitis. Pain was provoked by when, when the iliopsoas muscle was tested. MRI was negative and also the X-ray finding. Another example from football players. What is known in the literature about osteochondral disorders and apophysitis in youth athletes is, is scarce. Boys, what we see are boys between 16 and 19 years of age. A lot of football players with long standing groin pain with gradual onset. They have more pain during activities and fast running, and in particular when doing change of direction movements and shooting. They respond well on rest, but pain easily relapse, relapses during football activity. More pain bef uh, when performing stretching exercises and strengthening exercises more pain when performing stretching and strengthening exercises. Normal MRI findings. Uh, the adolescent population is vulnerable to maturation related injuries. We know it from the, from the knee and from the, from the um, uh, ankle area, from the heel. 
Groin-related injuries tend to increase with maturation during adolescence. Pelvic apophysitis is common in young athletes, and the different localizations are shown on this picture. The pubic symphysis is the last part of the human skeleton to mature. MRI shows that the pubic symphysis appearance in age dependent with most under 21 years of age demonstrating a pubic apophysitis, a, 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 a pubic apophysis. And this is the pubic apophysis, apophysis. That's a difficult word. I think I need a, a little bit more water. But as you can see here, not a lot of young athletes have problems here from, from, from the pelvis, this area. And then you have the, where the sartorius insertion is, the rec femoris insertion, and all, even the greater trochanter. But in football, we see most young athletes with problems from the pubic apophysis. Sally and co-workers have published a very good paper on pubic apophysitis, and to my knowledge, the only one. I would like to acknowledge, again, Rod Whiteley and his colleagues for a very nicely done and written paper. And it's based on data from Aspire Academy players. I encourage all of you, if you haven't read this article, to do so. It's a very nice paper. In this study, in this study, they found 26 symptomatic players in the age between 8 and 15 and 18, 31 asymptomatic players in the age between 9 and 30. They took X-ray, MRI, and CT scan. They found open pubic apophysis with stress-related facial changes in all symptomatic players. All symptomatic players also had closed pubic ap ap uh, apophysis were more than 21 years of old. Open pubic apophysis found up until the age of 26, which we didn't believe before this paper was published. So you can, you can have these kind of diagnosis even if they are into their 20s. So let me try to explain to you our approach at the Norwegian FA Medical Center. And it's not the, uh, the best one or the only one. I'm sure you have protocols here, but this is just an example. We have a multidisciplinary approach. And we look, we look at, at this with symptoms more than six weeks. We have a consultant in sports medicine and physical medicine and rehabilitation. We have a specialist in sports physiotherapy. And we have a consultant in orthopedic surgeon, surgery. And I believe we should have had a strength and conditioning coach as well. But we haven't so far. But I think that would have been uh, added value to, to this team. What we do is that. The physician, the physician is taking the history, is doing the physical exam, uh, and the athletes ahead of the first consultations is filling in the Hagos questionnaire. After that, <coughs> the patient is sent to the physiotherapist who is performing strength and functional tests. Usually these patients have taken MRI scan before they arrive, but if not, we may or we may not refer to MRI. We, we usually not send them to X-ray 
in this age group, but sometimes. The strength testing consists of dyno, dynamometer, and as Rod said yesterday, I use it every day and I find it very useful. Uh, we do this to get an objective baseline and a goal setting for the athlete. We also compare the results, the testing results, with the normative data in this age group. And we do it for evaluation and progression purposes to make sure that we progress in the rehab. Because I think we sometimes tend to be too uh, afraid of loading. But in this age group and with this population of patients, uh, loading is, is, must be done carefully. We also do the groin bar test. And here is a, a table which showing the, how this looks when we do the testing. So what is the role of biomechanics? There is an Irish group, uh, very, uh, and they have, pro uh, have published a lot of papers around biomechanics. And they are not so concerned about the, uh, the, uh, the anatomical localization of the pain. They are more concerned of the movement patterns. And I find it quite interesting. And we are doing a research project with the Copenhagen group and the Dublin group and the Norwegian group to see if we can move ahead also in this area. What do we do when we do the functional testing? We'll, we do the one-legged knee flexion test in various positions, one-legged hop tests, movement control testing of pelvis and trunk, and we go from static positions to more complex, complex dynamic movements. We go from running tests with no turns to running tests with turns and more sport-specific movements. When we have finished the history taking, which I, found, I find crucial, good history taking is key for a proper diagnosis. But also the Hagos is very nice tool that can help you getting more detailed information around the pain. But then we try to classify them into these entities. Is it an adductor related problem mainly or iliopsoas or inguinal or pubic? And to be fair, in this age group, this is very rare. This is more common, and you can argue what is the difference between this and this in this age, age group. It's sometimes difficult to distinguish. But as I told you, in uh, track and field athletes, this is more common. In footballers, this is the most common uh, entity. And then we don't see many hip-related, even if they show FIA on X-ray and FAI, FAI on X-ray or, or MRI, um, we don't see, uh, find many with severe hip-related problems. So what are the key symptoms and findings in these young athletes? And this is one of the learning objectives. So I'm, if you sleep now, wake up, please. Good. The interesting thing here is if you look at the Hagus, this is the pain, and 100 would mean that uh, a, a score of 100 would mean that they are doing well. So the pain is one part, and you see they have symptoms here during the day. Physical functioning da daily living is okay, but as when you go down to physical function and sports related activity, <coughs> the score tends to be uh, more poorer and poorer. And interestingly, the quality of life 
reports from these athletes is really, actually, they are depressed, a lot of these athletes. If you, and they don't know because they are so young, they don't know, know what it is to be depressed, but they are. And when you ask them, th this is how they rate themselves. They are having a terrible time with this pain, not knowing what to do with it. <coughs> Other findings, increased pain from isometric exercises, uh, admodum helmich, relatively strong adductors, relatively strong adductors, not as in the older population that have adductor-related problems, they are usually very weak in their adductors, but they have weak AB doctors. They have usually, and I, I say sometimes you need to be more than 18. You need to be an adult to see them move. Because it, it should be on pay TV. You know, because they, they try to control their pelvis and they are not able to. So they have a very poor pelvic and trunk movement control. And Usually, normal X-ray and MRI findings. And what they do, they respond well to a short period of complete rest. Complete <laughs> rest. And in the paper made by Rod and colleagues, they usually took them out of sport for up to four, six to eight weeks. Should we do the adductor strengthening program, Andreas, in this at least. What do you think? I think it's not out of the question, but it's probably not the first line. Our experience is be careful with this exercise in these athletes. Because they have the strength in their adductors, but you know this exercise also is activating the AB adductors a little bit, so but it's, it shouldn't be ruled out, but don't start an extensive program using this uh, exercise in these athletes. Do you know who he is? Norwegian. Yeah, you could tell. Thank you. <laughs> huh? He's the top scorer in Champions League at the moment. He plays for... Uh, uh, Red Bull Salzburg, he's a striker there, and he is, uh, he just, uh, he's 19 years old. Eight goals, and they are playing a decisive match against Liverpool next week. And if Salzburg is winning, Liverpool is not going to the group stages. No, they will not. They will not. Hmm? They will not. <laughs> okay. So, uh, return to sport and performance, and I think that's, that's, a long, that's a long journey. We have an international athlete here now, and, and return to running is, will not take long. But return to performance will for sure take much, much longer. Stage one, relative rest from aggravating activities, control the pain. Stage two, working on postural control impairments, focus on pelvic and trunk control. Stage three, progress into sport-specific exercises and specific strength exercises. Tools to monitor the pain, numeric rating scale from one to 10, Hagers, or the Copenhagen five-second squeeze test. You probably know this. Six to ten, red light, three to five, yellow light, and zero to two, green light. This means if you have zero to two, go on. Attention if you have a score between three and five, and stop with doing too much activity with a pain more than six, or from six and upwards. Okay? Return to sport and performance. Control of pain. Next, inform the, and empower the athlete. That's very important. You know that, all of you. The athletes, 
The patient is the key, not you, not me. The patient is, should be in the center of our attention, and we should empower them. Not tell them what to do, but involve them, educate them, explain them, get them on board. That's key. And they have a lot of good information to tell you, and they will also be more motivated in their return to play if they are part of that process. And as always, communication with coach and technical staff is crucial, and between the different clinicians. In most football clubs, we are complaining about the manager, but in most clubs, the tensions within the medical team is even worse, Ian. Isn't that true? Fighting to be treating the best players in, in the squad. It's about you and me and not the player and the team. That's not good. Shouldn't be like that. So learn how to communicate. Don't put yourself in front. Try to be a team player, a team member. It's not a group of individuals. It's a group that plays well together. So what can young football players learn from young athletes in individual sports? And I think that's important. That's load management. And being in, a, in an academy or in a club saying, I don't want to train today because I don't feel all right, that's not easy. But if you are an individual athlete or an athlete in an individual sport, that is more common. So they have to, in team sports, they have to learn from individualized planning of sessions and matches, especially in this age group. They need to have recovery between sessions and try to avoid spikes in load, which will increase the injury risk. And individualized progression is key. It's not a protocol-based rehab. It's a symptom and strength and function based. Treatment plan. Science, clinical work, is teamwork. And here you have to, I have been his uh, supervisor. He defended his thesis in November last uh, year. He's working in the clinic. I was able to recruit him to to my clinic, and uh, he's doing a fantastic job. He's also working with an under-19 under national team as a physiotherapist, also a former player. And this man doesn't need any further uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's nice to work with Christian Torborg. You know, we don't like the Danes, but we like Andreas. Uh, but uh, he, he's a true researcher, and he has also experience from clinical work and from, foot, from football. So thank you very much. Now it's time for some questions.